What's going on, Wolfpack? My name is Dinarik Wolf, and welcome to some more Bosnian Reacts 2 Geography Now India this time. This one's going to be great because uh, this is one of my most uh, sought after videos ever. I'm, uh, ever since I started doing this, from letter A, everybody was like, from Afghanistan, everybody was like, hey, can you react to India? When are you going to react to India? And I keep saying, oh, I'm going alphabetically, we'll get there eventually. They're like, India, India. And all right, you'll finally get India this time. What to say about this country? There's this. I don't even know where to start because this country is just rich with history. Uh, I guess all our, mo especially in Eastern Europeans, when our moms get home, they just turn on the TV and watch their favorite Indian soap opera. I know my, my mom did exactly that. So, the food is great. Very rich cultures. They're not one people. There's no. There are many peoples in uh, India. The Tamils. You probably heard of the Pashtuns. Uh, other peoples, <laughs> uh, so the Ganges River, I don't know, Hindu religion, the Rig Vedas, uh, Krishna, <laughs> for fuck's sake, I can just go on, but uh, Paul will explain a lot more about it, this one's going to be a long one, so buckle your seatbelts, get your curry, get your coffee, and uh, then get back to the video, because we are starting. Jargis so, now, we India. have finally encroached upon the giant India. Some of you have been waiting a long time for this episode. Yeah. <laughs> I'm just going to say straight up. You all know India is incredibly complex and diverse. Even Indians have trouble understanding their own country. Obviously, I won't be able to scratch even the surface in this episode, but I'll try Me my too. best. A lot of you I'll try my best to add on way, more. So thank you, and without further ado, let's begin. Also, some people have been telling me my screen's sort of cut out. I check, always check my um, uh, recording software to see if my, the screen is full. And it is. I ch I'm checking it right now. And it is. But for some reason, when I get into a video, sometimes it cuts out. For some reason. I don't know why, but... Uh, sorry, you know, if that happens. But uh, I'm checking everything, and it seems fine. Just when I render it, it's terrible. Occasionally. Sometimes it's perfect, sometimes it's cut off. I don't know. I don't know, man. It's time to learn geography. Ah! Hey everybody, I'm your host Barbie. This place doesn't even need much of an introduction. Everybody has heard of India. I gave it's it big, an introduction. It's, loud, it's colorful, and most importantly, it has a plethora of confusing territorial anomalies that I just Cash can't wait to cover. Here uh oh, I started a war right there. <laughs> There's an old saying, India is a place where everyone is in a hurry, but no one is ever on time. First of all, India is located in South Asia, right on the Indian and Arabian Seas and the Bay of the Bengal. The most populated by area six other countries. in so the world. So close to seven, but that land bridge between Sri Lanka got wiped away like 600 okay. years ago by a psych... Okay, some of you have probably heard of that land bridge, but um... Here's my question. Why don't they, like Sri Lanka and the Indian governments, get together and build like a bunch of sandbanks? You know, like what China does? To like uh, build build their own artificial islands in the South China Sea. Why don't you build some artificial islands here and then build a road across it, and then you can have actually like trucking or moving around from Sri, Sri Lanka and India a lot. I guess that would be super expensive, and also there's a lot of shipping going on here, so that might get rid of the shipping. So. I don't know. Let the Indians figure that out. <laughs> India is divided into 29 states and seven union territories with the capital New Delhi, which acts as its own administrative unit located in the capital territory. Keep in mind, New Delhi is actually just the name of one of the districts in the capital territory made up of 11. The largest city, however, is actually Mumbai with New Delhi, Bangalore, Bollywood, Bangalore Central. and Hyderabad following after. However, the four busiest airports are Delhi Indira Gandhi International, Mumbai's Chhatrapati Shivaji International, Bengaluru's Kempe Golda International, and Chennai International in the south. Ah, uh, you know why I'm smiling. This is my favorite part of any episode we ever make. <laughs> Territorial anomaly time. India is loaded with strange uh -oh. borders and deliciously complex demarcation lines. First of all, what exactly is a union territory? In the simplest way I can put this, union territories are places that are too distinct to be incorporated into a state, but too small to have their own local governments. The first one, of course, is the Delhi National Capital Territory, where the capital lies. Chandigarh is a post-independent city constructed to replace Lahore as the capital of the Punjab area after it was split up between India and Pakistan. Then you have the island territory, the smallest one, Lakshadweep, and the Andaman and Nicobar Islands. Mm -hmm. The Andaman Islands being home to one of the last uncontacted people groups on the planet, the Sentinelese tribe, whom have been hostile to visitors and are therefore left alone. As well as yeah, sometimes they would actually like try to shoot uh, helicopters down with their bow and arrows, <laughs> which I kind of found cute. Kind of find cute, but there's like it's assumed that there's only around like uh, what was it 400 or 500 of them? I read that live on the island. If you look at the island from from above. You won't see anything but uh, forest, so you can't kind of see them wherever they live in the Andaman Islands, and you can't contact them because they're aggressive, so 
there's that. So anyway, uh, I like to add things in in my in my own uh, in my in my part. So uh, a lot of people um, are wondering like what's the difference between an Indian and Pakistani? Basically, you know, most when they when they were split up from the British, uh, Pakistan was made for uh, like the Muslim peoples, and India was made for the ethnic Hindu peoples. It wasn't really a very peaceful like shifting of peoples there but uh it is what it is now indians and pakistanis some of them are like completely like the same peoples uh like the punjabi region to the north there the punjabis in pakistan punjabis in uh indians as, in india as well and uh in pakistan is one of the oldest within pakistan was one of the oldest uh uh, civilizations of all time uh, all, the Indus, Indus Valley civilization I'm pretty sure some of you have heard of it from the Indus River in Pakistan and actually that is where India got its name from a Pakistani river okay <laughs> but that, that that's that so um, uh, India is more known for its Ganges River which is just the, to the north of here it is one of the largest rivers in the world and it empties like right there there's this delta right there through Bangladesh largest delta in the world Unfortunately for the Indians, the Ganges River Delta is not commercially, commercially navigable. You know I love my navigable rivers, and unfortunately for the Indians, not navigable. If it was, probably one of the most uh, uh, capital wealthy places in the world by far. But uh, shipping, because a lot of uh, sediments build up on, in the river, you can't really put large ships on it. So there's that. Okay, let, let me stop talking. Let Paul so the Nicobar talk. Islands, which actually used to be a short lived colony of Denmark. Finally, the three remaining territories are former European colonies. Hey, y'all remember that? Dadra Denmark. And Nagar Haveli, <laughs> Daman and Diu, which are separated by about 200 kilometers across the Gulf of Kabat. And the most confusing <laughs> Union territory, the French speaking Puducherry, which is actually split up between four district cities across India Karikal, Mahe, Yanaon, and Pondicherry. Pondicherry is strange because it has 11 enclaves within the Tamil Nadu state. Oh, and in this area, you can also find that experimental hippie ish commune with a little bit of controversy look it up on don't forget here the eastern states also known as the seven sisters are connected by this incredibly narrow 27 kilometer wide pathway known as the siliguri corridor this pathway is like a crucial artery that completes the india puzzle or so you would think now let's discuss the juicy stuff now in the china episode i already talked about the disputed areas with india such as mm -hmm. aksai chin and arunachal pradesh the latter pretty much just belonging to india as it's almost completely inhabited and operated by indians so let's move to the other disputes now as of 2015 the bangladesh episode is already outdated as india India and Bangladesh have finally come to an agreement over the frighteningly complex former enclave exclave dispute. In the end, India only lost about 40 square kilometers of land to Bangladesh, and now only a few enclaves and exclaves exist. Now let's head. Now, when you try to draw the shape of India, you might want to be careful which depiction you use. Some might use this picture, some might use this, some might use this, and those that don't really study very well might use this. The point is, the whole area. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> I didn't expect that, but uh, uh, basically they've. They fought off this region between yeah Pakistan and China. They kind of lost it to the Chinese on that part. But this India up here, this India, this part of India up here is, is known as the Indian Kashmir region. And there's the Pakistani Kashmir region. And Indians and Pakistanis claim the entire region for themselves. Now, for geopolitical reasons, India wants to, to, do, to do this. So it splits up Pakistan from a potentially much larger and more powerful rival, the Chinese. Of course, the Chinese want to, uh, you know, uh, how should I say, dominate the region more or have more control over the region because India, being a powerful state as, as well, is a great rival to the, to the Chinese. So the Chinese want to avoid India becoming as powerful as possible and they kind of use Pakistan and they're building like a corridor through there. So there's more trade going on there and they can actually help the Pakistanis develop more. A more developed Pakistan is a bigger problem for uh, the Indians, if the Indians and Pakistanis are focusing more on each other, they focus less on China. And, and that's one of the reasons why the Chinese and Pakistanis are super big buds, because the enemy of my enemy is my friend, basically. And uh, yeah, they want to do that, and that's why they're kind of fighting, fighting over that region. Over geopolitical re reasons. Now, I'm, I'm more of a real politic guy, and I believe that that part is more true than any other 
uh, reason why they're fi fighting over it. So anyway, I'll let Paul continue. is like continue. the most heavily militarized, diplomatically stressed out region on the planet. It's already had like four wars in the past half century. Basically, India, Pakistan, and to some extent China all want the entire area for themselves, although it's more of like a Pakistan-India thing. In the China episode, we already discussed the Chinese disputes with India, so I won't cover those in this episode. If you want to learn more, just watch the China episode. But anyway, this entire area was a former domain known as the princely state of Jammu and Kashmir that was under royal Maharaja rulers all the way up until independence. Currently, this place is split up by this fenced off militarized line known as the line of control between India and Pakistan. Why is this? Well, in the quickest way I can put this, okay, the British are out. We get to take your land. Uh, no, we want to be an independent princely state. Uh, we're supposed to take your land and majority of your people are Muslim, just like us, even though your ruler is Hindu as well. Hey, India? Yeah? If you help me, I'll let you secede my territory to your land with autonomy. Deal. <laughs> <laughs> ha, your problem now. I love how Mike. Oh man, that <laughs> that is gonna cause controversy in the comments below. <laughs> but uh, yeah, it's fine. Played India. He totally represents India. Oh, and keep in mind, Pakistan's capital, Islamabad, is less than 80 kilometers away from all that drama. Also, uh, if you take a look at night on the uh, line between like India and uh, Pakistan here, this is just a flat land, by the way. So there's no natural boundaries that can act as you know. Uh, a wall between them and they actually have a very large militarized zone here even larger than the one in North Korea I believe and you can see it at night from space you can actually see all the lights from the militarized zone the line of control meanders through the mountains until it stops at a point called NJ9842. This is where things get really crazy because from there you hit the Siachen Glacier, the second longest non-polar glacier in the world and this is pretty much the dead man zone. After point NJ9842 also forgot to mention that Pakistan wants the Kashmir region because that's where all their rivers uh, start. You know, the ones that flow into like the Indus River start here, so they want to control the you know spring heads of those rivers. If if India were in were in control of those rivers, it would be bad for Pakistan. But because imagine if they start building a hydroelectric power plants for to you know fuel their economy and their energy needs for India, that'd be bad for the Pakistanis because all their agriculture is really based around the Indus River and. Uh, uh, irrigation around the Indus River. So less water for them, less food for them, very bad for them. Good for India, I guess, because they're going to get uh, hydroelectric power. I'm just giving an, an example. That's why they're, they're, they're fighting over that region a lot. <laughs> Two, you hit the actual ground position line, a series of military outposts Sorry, that I'm extend all the way lot. to the Chinese border. That means everything in this area is ground zero for the Indo-Pak tension. And you know, the crazy thing is there's actually literally small towns of normal, regular civilians living in these areas high up in the mountains. Normal, Many regular. of which just go about <laughs> daily life, going to work and raising their families. Otherwise, they have a river dispute with Nepal and various river islands disputed with Bangladesh. Outside of all the dispute stuff, though, India not only has the world's second largest road network and three of the world's top ten megacities and their own space program but they also have a code they made it to mars of landmarks and notable R Rover. sites way too many to list but some of the ones that you guys the indian geography peeps have told me to mention include places like the abandoned danush kodi ghost city golconda mm -hmm. fort the four pillars of charminar the ajanta buddhist art caves the alora monolithic ruins mandu fortress the golden temple which feeds over 100,000 people a day the golgumbaz mausoleum the kalavantin durg post the ruins of hampi the hill forts of rajasthan shatrunjaya cool. hill which is basically like a mecca for jains the temple of the bodhi tree mm -hmm. Mahal, Bangar Fort, the most haunted place in India, <laughs> Mahabat Makbara, and keep in mind, just like in China, you can find a great wall of India in Rajsaman. There's also the Paritala Anjaneya Temple with the largest statue in India depicting Hanuman, and at over 100... Uh, there's even a larger statue now, I believe, depicting some sort of politician or something. But, uh, yeah, it must be very fun to be, uh, to be living in India and being, you know, a uh, tourist there. An inner, inner tourist in your own country, because... Uh, in, in Bosnia, there's nothing really that much to see in Bosnia, so basically Sarajevo, Mostar, and maybe like Yaitse. I guess that's about it when it comes to the really interesting spots in Bosnia. But uh, if you're in India, you can just there's a lot of things to see. It's like never-ending inner tourism, I guess. You didn't even mention the Taj Mahal yet. 50 acres, the Sri Rangan Atas. Oh yeah, did I mention the Sikhs? Yeah, they they live here. And also, this is one of the first places that Christianity spread in India. It didn't spread entirely, but Swami Temple, the largest Hindu temple in the world. Oh yeah, and there's also that building with the stuff and the thing, whatever. Anyway, we could go on for centuries talking Famous about his rich constructed domicile, but what it lies on top of is even more fascinating. Now, don't make this mistake. I'm going to India. All I need are my sandals and sunscreen. Oh, crap. <laughs> 
Now, as the seventh largest <laughs> country in land area, India has a wide Before. range of landscapes, climates, and elevations that all contrast from one corner to the other. First of all, let's talk about the north. India sits on the Indian tectonic plate that essentially smashed into the yep. Eurasian plate, which in return created the largest mountain range in the world, the Himalayas. The force is so strong that it's estimated that the Himalayas grow about 2.4 inches or 6.1 centimeters every year. There's also where you can that's find Kanchenjunga, the tallest mountain. So that's about, uh, I don't know, give or take this much a year. Over, over the course of our lives, the Himalayas have actually grown quite a bit. In India, or the third in the world, right on the border of Nepal. Keep your eye on these mountains. These are pretty much the source of most of India's major rivers that give life to the whole country. That's why India takes these mountains so seriously. You can also find the largest natural lake, Ular, up in the Jammu Kashmir area. Below the Himalayas, you reach the North Indian River Plain, sometimes referred to as the Indus Ganga. This is the most fertile part of India where the most important rivers like the Ganges and its tributaries flow. Heading a little south, you reach the Satpura and Vindhya ranges that pretty much divide North India from South India. On each side, you get the West and East Ghat mountains mountains, which in return creates this massive triangle thing called the Deccan Plateau. This place is moderately forest, especially in the east, in the Chotra Nagpur Plateau, where you get a section of the swampy Sundarbans that they share with Bangladesh. Check out the Bangladesh episode. Head a little west and you get the dry tar desert along the border with Pakistan, as well as the Ran of Kutch known as the Salt Desert. And finally, the only active volcanic area would be the Adaman and Nicobar Islands, with Barren Island having actual conical eruptions and Bharatan having tame mud volcanoes. Now here's the thing, although India has a relatively high population density, they do relatively well with maintaining their ecological footing. In fact, in 2016, they beat a world record by planting, disputably, 50 million trees in one day. They've hey, Mr. Beast, there's an idea for you. <laughs> so anyway, uh, also most of them are, not most of them, I don't know about most of them, but a lot of them are vegetarians, as a matter of fact. We all know about the cow thing. Uh, they don't really need to eat meat because they have a very rich diet without meats. But everybody else here in, in Europe, we know, you know that we're the biggest meat, biggest meat eaters. They've also agreed to reforest about 12% of their country by 2030. The most heavily Good forested job. area being the seven sister states in East India. Now, one of the factors that contributes to this would be the fact that India has the lowest meat consumption in the world, oh, there it is. the highest population percentage of vegetarians at around 40%. Most of whom 40%. are lacto-vegetarians that consume milk products. By the way, in India, when buying groceries, this label means vegetarian and this one means not vegetarian. Nonetheless, the remainder of the population does typically eat some kind of animal protein, mostly in the forms of seafood or chicken, but almost never beef or pork unless if you are part of the Muslim or Christian minorities scattered throughout the West and East areas. Now let's talk about the role of cattle, shall we? India has more cattle and livestock than anywhere else in the world at around 330 million. And it's interesting because since they have prevalent Hindu traditions, the killing of cows is illegal in many of the states except for a few, and each state has varying degrees of punishment for committing intentional cow slaughter. Keyword intentional. Cows accidentally get hit by cars all the time. Once a cow is too old to produce milk, it typically is released into the open to die naturally in the wild, ideally. Nonetheless, male cattle get it much worse as they are deemed as kind of useless some places <laughs> use them as draft animals for labor some religious sects use them as sacrifices but otherwise they are typically sold to the underground market for beef or hides to this day there are about six times as many female cows as male cattle in india so that means yeah something's happening to the males nonetheless india does have the third highest carbon emission rate after china and the u.s fourth if you consider the eu however emission per capita they rank pretty low at only about two kilotons per person just you right. that with cutter at about 40. there are 94 national wait parks, for economic animals sanctuaries Gross. across the country where you can find some of the national animals like the peacock, the Ganges River dolphin, the king cobra, the Indian elephant, and the highest population of Bengal tigers in the world, which are all Man, highly so protected. Cool. India also has the most irrigated land in the world, which allows them to become the number one producer of multiple products like millet, bananas, lemons, limes, mangoes, ginger, chickpeas, milk, butter, fennel, jute, and about 75% of the world's <laughs> spices alone come from India. Speaking of which, food! Typically, the staples, I forgot about Japan, that. <laughs> and naan in the north, idli and dosa in the south and everybody eats rice the more commonly commercialized indian foods that we in the west grew up knowing like samosas Curry. tikka masala tandoori's and my favorite india dish palak paneer these usually come from the northern regions of india what is that Mm, seriously, India, you took spinach and made it fat. I love you guys. Otherwise, the West is most known for their chutneys and pickled foods, as well as beef, since there's a high number of Muslims and Christians. The South uses a lot more coconut and has some of the best curries, like porials, sambras, rasams, and tutus. And the East is known for having the best desserts, like peda, mishti doi, rasgula, or shondesh. Speaking of which, India is so diverse and complex that sometimes even Indian people need translators when going to different states. It's about to get 10 times more confusing in about three, 
two, one. Many languages, or like uh, 80 languages, I think. Shashi Turur once said, In India, we celebrate the commonality of major differences. We are a land of belonging rather than blood. First of all, India has a population of about 1.3 billion people and is the second most populous country in the world after China with about 18% of the world's first. population. About 72% of the country is... L let me just say, uh, Indo-Aryan. I didn't know, I didn't know that was a thing. Okay. But, uh, anyway, um... India was usually the most populated place in the world, but um, because China actually developed a lot faster, industrialized a lot faster than India, they've hit the, you know, they, they hit the, what, what you call the population ceiling. So basically that's when the population starts to slowly shrink. Uh, a lot of the European countries and uh, East Asia countries are going through that because they've um, developed so much, not, not many people are having kids anymore. Uh, because they're industrialized, people focus on work rather than having kids anymore. But India was slower than China to industrialize, so... And that's a lot because of pol political reasons. It acts more like a federation. It, you know, complicates everything, and, and it causes slower industrial growth. So the Indians grew slower, So, but they're getting there, and when, once they industrialize, they will hit that ceiling as well, but they will have more population... They will have more people living in their country than China, then. Indo-Aryan and a quarter are Dravidian, and the majority of the remainder Dravid are Mongoloid, Asian, and other people groups. They also use the Indian rupee as their currency. They use the type C, D, and M Mahatma Gandhi. Elements, and they drive on the left side of the road. By the way, technically it's illegal for these banknotes to leave the country, but you guys have sent me a lot of them for fan mail for Fan Friday videos, so I don't want to go to jail. <laughs> Again. Now keep in mind, those statistics that Again. I just mentioned are incredibly generalized. What happened, of the Indo Aryan and Dravidian communities, there are about 2,000 different ethno linguistic people groups in India with about 645 district indigenous tribes, 52 major ones. So obviously we can't cover them all, but what we do know is that the north is very different from the south. For one, the north mostly speaks in languages that are all related to the Indo Aryan branch, with languages like Hindi, Bengali, Punjabi, and Gujarati, whereas the south speaks a completely unintelligible Dravidian branch with languages like Tamil, Telugu, Malayalam, and Kannada. <laughs> Otherwise, there's also pockets of Sino <laughs> yeah, that, that, That's what I was thinking every time I saw that. But uh, uh, who are the Tamil kings? Mostly traders, I bet. Uh, get it? Because I was trying to make a, you know, Bill Wirtz joke. Or Astro Asiatic <laughs> languages spoken in the far north and east. Wait, so how do they all, like, communicate with? Each other. Great question. English. Although India does not have an official language, there are 22 recognized national languages, and of these, two are the most prevalent, taught in schools and used by government officials, Hindi and English. And very okay. often, these two are like mixed mid-sentence. It's weird. Don't be surprised if yeah, you're yeah, yeah, speaking Hindi and then suddenly finishing off in English. It's like... It's like, what is this? And I was like, this? And I was like, trying to... Like, why are you even trying to do that? I know, right? <laughs> and the washing machine... A Bob Saget with a chainsaw. <laughs> Whenever I watch, like, uh... Like, uh... Of parts of the Indian soap opera. I never watched all of it. I've seen parts of it. We've all saw parts of, parts of it. Uh, you know when they do that whole cutscene thing where they're all shocked and it, it changes from one to another. Okay, I'm going off track, but basically that is exactly what I hear in Indian. Uh, they, they even say like "I am the boss." Like I remember seeing that, hearing that from an Indian soap opera. Like she actually said "I am the boss," like completely in English. Like what the hell? Now, of course, let's discuss the one thing that goes hand-in-hand -hand with India, Hinduism. About 80% of India claims to be Hindu, ah, or at Krishna. least part of the Hindu practicing community. Now, we don't have time Avatar. to explain everything <laughs> the true about Avatar. the tenets and multi-layered philosophies and practices of Hinduism. If you want to know, just talk to a Hindu person. But basically, one thing you do need to know is that Hindu-driven ideologies Ganesh. pretty much dominate most of life in India, everything from family to business. You will see colorful, mesmerizing shrines, temples, Shiba. statues, and rituals being performed everywhere, even in public. On the Bharat Mata, the mother of India, statues are everywhere. She's like the symbol of India. The largest Hindu pilgrimage, the Kumela, happens every three years, rotating between four cities in which the adherents bathe in the Ganges River and enjoy a massive festival with tens of millions of so people. So many people like, peering Seriously, it. you can practically see it happening from space. Now, a controversial topic in relation to Hinduism would be the caste system, which is basically a belief that people are born into a socioeconomic life that they are destined That's to probably bad. into. Today, however, the system is more fluid and loose from what it used to be from a long time ago, and thanks to economic reforms, anybody with enough drive can kind of move up the social ladder regardless of birth. Nonetheless, India is home to every That's major good. religion <laughs> in the world, even a few Jews, including the B'nai Menashe, an indigenous group that claimed to be one of the lost tribes of Israel. In fact, Judaism and Christianity actually had a head start in India way before it even kicked off in Europe. As tradition holds, Cochin, or Malabar Jews, migrated around 1000 BC to trade during the times of King Solomon, and in 53 AD, Thomas, the apostle of Jesus, arrived in what is now the state of Kerala to establish the first church in India. Today, most Christians are found in the southwest and far east Seven Sisters regions. India also holds the highest population of Sikhs, Jains, and Zoroastrians, mostly found in the north, and the second largest 
largest Muslim population in the world after Indonesia. Most Muslims are populated around the northwest areas by Pakistan or in the east by Bangladesh. Oh, and don't forget the Buddhists. In fact, Buddhism actually started in India. Today, the Dalai Lama even takes refuge in Tespur in the state of Assam. Oh, that was a lot of information. Ah! Okay, so by now you can probably get a grasp of how incredibly mixed and diversified India's population is, but what exactly holds the country together? Well, for one, you kind of have to understand Indian history, which will take way too long to explain, but in the quickest way I can put it, Indus Valley, Maurya and Gupta empires, Southern empires, Golden Age, Middle Kingdoms, a ton of new religions come flocking in, the North fell to the Delhi Sultanate, the South became the Vijaya Nagara Empire, the Mughal Empire starts, British East India Company, direct British rule, nationalist movements, independence, republic, economic liberalization in 1991, and here we are today. <laughs> <laughs> oh man, anybody who's played EU4 out there uh, has probably pronounced it uh, a couple of times like that. Vijayanagar, which means, I, I know the Nagar part means city, I don't know about the Vijayana part. I read like City of Victory, I don't know how true that is made up of around 500 smaller royal princely states and when the British came in they kind of exploited them to manage such a huge population. Although India is a democratic federal republic and the largest democracy in the world the old royal families still exist today and although they have no political power they hold high positions of influence in their communities across India. So today technically you could meet someone that would be considered an Indian prince or princess. Nonetheless the biggest thing that really united Indians in the past two centuries would probably be their hatred of British rule. It was kind of like well <laughs> this is not cool. Yep. What do you say you and I work together in a end this thing? Essentially, one good thing you could say that came out of imperialism was that it kind of stopped all the internal squabbling and unified the groups towards one common goal. To get also China. imperialism. <laughs> Today, Indians are just proud to be Indian. I mean, a Tamil soccer player can get cheered on by a Rajasthani. A Punjabi pop star can sell out tickets in Orissa. Speaking of which, all Indians love movies and music. India has the second largest film industry in terms of volume, pumping out nearly 2,000 films per year. Surprisingly, Nigeria pumps out more. However, the box office revenues gross out at only about $2 billion annually compared to Hollywood at over 10 billion, but still, it's impressive. And keep in mind, it's not just Bollywood, but it's also Tollywood, Gollywood, Hollywood, <laughs> really? Hollywood, and so on. There's like 20 different woods. What's Bollywood then? Oh, and like every movie in India Mumbai? has at least one scene where everybody Bombay? breaks out in song, and there's almost always a happy ending. Unfortunately, mainstream media has also put an aesthetic strain on many of the people, as it's almost become an obsession to be light or fair-skinned, causing people to go so far as to buy skin-bleaching products. Some other controversies include things I don't need like to bleach illiteracy my skin. being an issue in many parts of the country, especially in the rural areas. But I, I mean, come on, the country skin. has literally hundreds of different writing systems go figure i mean give him a break also many of you guys the indian geography have asked me to bring awareness to the fact that india does unfortunately have some of the highest rates of human trafficking and child slavery the government is trying to crack down and culture is slowly being reformed but for now it's a sad reality that still does exist hey here at gn we talk about the good and the bad i'm just saying otherwise sports do definitely tie everyone together as well especially cricket the national sport even though they also used to do really well in field hockey india also has a lot of their own indigenous sports like dopkel in assam bull racing in kerala <laughs> in suknar rod Pushing in Mizoram and Malakamba, this strange pole what? yoga gymnastics thing in the south. Otherwise, Hold my people from India I'm or Indian that. descent might include people like Siddhartha Gautama or the Buddha, oh, Mahavir, yeah. Buddha. Ashoka the Great, Prithviraj Chauhan, Aurangzeb, Shivaji of the Maratha Empire, Mohandas or Mahatma Gandhi, Indira Gandhi, Subhash Chandra Bose, Jawahar Lal Nehru, Rabindranath Tagore, C. V. Raman, Satyendra Nath Bose, Bhagat Singh, Dr. A. P. J. Abdul Kalam, Shah Rukh Khan, Amitabh Bachchan, Amir Khan, Salman. Salman Khan, Priyana Chopra, Ben Kingsley, Sundar Pichai, Satya Narayana Nadella, A.R. Rahman, Sachin Tendulkar, and Mahendra Singh Dhoni. There's also literally... Okay, I actually know uh, quite a few of them. I'm surprised by myself. I actually know a lot of Indi Indians. Millions of other famous people I missed out on. If you want to mention them, please, there's a comment section below. Use it. In the meantime, we got to finish this info marathon, shall we? T-Series? Well, that's not a person, but... Now, no surprise, India is huge and therefore has a huge international outreach when it comes to diplomacy to almost everyone except their immediate neighbors. First of all, countries with large population percentages of Hindus and Indians like Fiji, Guyana, Suriname, Trinidad and Tobago, Mauritius and Malaysia typically stay close to India's roster of go-to mm. friends. They enjoy cordial relations with trade. Now the UK may have left on a sour note, but they still have a lot of ties to their former colonizer in terms of business and tourism. A lot of India Indians is still part of the Commonwealth, not Commonwealth Britain. realm, there's a difference. And the UK has over 1.5 million citizens of Indian descent. As mentioned in the China episode, China is kind of like India's, I'm only here mm. to do business with you and nothing else friend. 
as drama still hasn't subsided in regards to the territory conflicts. Now, when it comes to the U.S., things started kind of sour back in the 70s during the Indo-Pak War of 1971, when the U.S. sided with Pakistan, their arch nemesis. Today, relations have cooled off. Mostly, the U.S. supports India's move towards democracy and is a key ally in the military conflicts in the Middle East. When it comes to their best friends, however, most of the Indians I talked to have said Russia and Bhutan. Russia because during the Indo-Pak Wars, Russia came in and supported them, and ever since then, each country has held a high position of respect for the other, especially as global superpowers. Bhutan and India signed a treaty of friendship almost immediately after independence. The two countries have shared interests and a currency-pegged system as well. Bhutan even supported the annexation of their cousins in the Sikkim state into India as it gave a nice buffer of land from China's stake to their claim. In conclusion, you will not find anywhere else on oh. Earth like India. Good Thousands moment. and millions of people inhabiting a colorful, majestic green, slightly gritty at times, slab of Earth, blessed and cursed in so many ways, yet wonderfully harmonized, mostly in a unity unlike anywhere else. In the end, that's <laughs> India. I get ah! it. Stay tuned, Indonesia is coming up next. Man, there's so many uh, good states coming up next, uh, so stay tuned for that. Anyway, let's finish off the flag. Hey everybody, welcome back to Flag Slash Fan Friday. Hope you liked the India episode. Dude, there were so many of you Indian geography peeps that contacted us and wanted to help out with the episode. I couldn't read all of them. There was like over 200, but I did get a lot of great information from you guys, so thank you. Fun side note, I knew pretty much nothing was gonna come of it, but I did, just for fun. I tried to contact Lily Singh just, just to see if she wanted to be in the episode. I never heard back. Plus, I think she was like in Trinidad and Tobago and she was filming something. Plus, she's way too popular to collaborate with me. But that's okay. So anyway, flag time. Let's go without further ado Ah, India, huge country with too much backstory, so many different diverse people groups, but the cool thing is they kind of know how to move forward together. First of all, the flag is a horizontal tricolor of green, white, and Indian saffron. Make sure you distinguish it apart from orange. It's not orange, it's Indian saffron. And in the middle lies the Ashoka Chakra or the Dharma Wheel. The configuration was first proposed by Gandhi back in the 1920s. Later on, the meanings of each color were as follows. The saffron stood for courage, sacrifice, and dedicated leaders. The white for peace dedicated and truth, leaders. as well as being a light towards the path of truth and the green for faith chivalry and the relation to plant life which all other life depends on now the wheel originally the wheel was meant to depict a traditional fabric spinning wheel to represent the indian strife for self-reliance gandhi was known himself to have fabricated all his own clothing by a spinning wheel but eventually it took on the image of the ashoka chakra or dharma wheel now what exactly is that well you kind of have to know a little bit about hinduism essentially the ashoka chakra is a 24 spoked wheel that appears on many ancient indian sites such as pillars boulders and Cave. Some might say that the wheel is directly tied in with all Indian religions, Hinduism, Buddhism, Jainism, and Sikhism, as it portrays the law of Dharma or the cosmic. Uh, by the way, you all know what that is, right? But back then, this was actually quite a symbol of peace, the uh, swastika, which was just like ancient Sumerian or something, which means like uh, something that is good, the swastika. But unfortunately, we all know who used it and made it infamous. And we can't use it anymore. Things. Now, it's kind <laughs> of difficult of to explain in a short amount of time exactly what it means, but according to the philosopher and former president, Sarvapali Radhakrishnan, it signifies truth and virtue to move forward as the wheel denotes motion and there is life in motion, as well as dynamism and peaceful change. I hope that's kind of like a somewhat satisfactory summary. I mean, there's a lot more that goes into it, but Eastern philosophy is so complex and it takes too long to condense it into such a short format. Also, keep in mind, they've had a ton of different flags for different kingdoms and empires throughout time. There were independence movement flags and pretty much all the princely states and people groups had some kind of symbolic configuration. Too many to list, but you get the point. Now the coat of arms, which is more like an emblem. The image was actually taken from the sculpture of the Sarnat lion capital built by the Indian emperor Ashoka using a single piece of polished sandstone. The lions are standing on a platform with yet another Ashoka chakra representing truth and honesty, as well as animals like horses and bulls most likely representing strength and resilience of the people. Underneath it all is the revered Sanskrit verse Satya Mev Jayate, which translates to something along the lines of truth always wins you cannot lie to yourself lots of philosophy and mind games when it comes to india they love that stuff whereas i'm just like there i like sandwiches all right so that's about it you know what time it is <laughs> the end of the video okay so there was y'all waited for it y'all got it my god it's, it feels like i've been recording for like an hour now this is probably my longest recording ever so hopefully you all enjoyed hopefully i got that watch time hopefully all of india watched me so thank you all for uh watching and as always take care